Good. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Right. <laughs> All right. This is Linux File System Forensics. My name is Gary Smith. I'm a, I'm a cybersecurity analyst at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. There's our sticker down there in the bottom. We're over on the dry side of Washington, where we get six inches of rain a year if we're lucky. This is uh, Linux File System Forensics. The who, what, when, where, why, and how of investigating a Linux disk image. So, what kinds of analysis can you do on a system, regardless of whether it's a Linux system, a Windows system, a Mac? Well, there's, there's basically two kinds. There's live analysis, where you're physically or by some connection on a live working system and you're doing some type of magic on it to determine has an incident happened, do we have a breach, uh, who's logged on. You're trying to capture volatile information about what's going on on the system to make some sort of problem determination. Or you're doing dead analysis where you've got a disk image or a series of disk images and you're asking that those questions again of who, what, when, where, why, and how to make some sort of determination about what the history is. Now, there's live, there's dead. Who's a, who's a Walking Dead fan? Walking Dead fan? Okay. I, I've kind of been wondering if there's maybe a third kind of analysis where the system is dead but it's still sort of alive and you're trying to figure out what's going on and you're not really sure and it's eating your brain. Um, I've seen this happen when a system has gotten into sort of a locked up state and you can move the mouse and then the pointer moves but you can't do anything else so maybe at that point it's a zombie and whatever. Um, Linux file system, Linux forensics is different from Windows. Obviously, Windows is not the same as Linux, and Linux is not the same as Windows. But there are things that carry over as far as terms and concepts from one to the other. Um, for instance, Linux doesn't have a registry. Windows does. And a lot of what you do in Windows is you scour through the registry looking for important information, artifacts, keys, stuff like that. You don't have a registry in Linux, but um, you do have similar concepts of what you're trying to do. So what we're going to be doing in this tutorial is we're going to be looking at a disk image of a potentially compromised Linux system. We will be going through trying to find the five W's and one H through looking at a timeline for the system and for a file system. We're going to be extracting artifacts from that image to uh, provide evidence and reach a series of conclusions about uh, if was the system compromised, how was it compromised, what went on. Okay, so we have a scenario base for this. The scenario is, is that I'm a forensic examiner and this company called Premier Fabrication Engineering, PFE, they think that one of their servers, their primary servers, PFE1, may have gone through some kind of a compromise, been involved in an incident. So um, they have engaged me as a forensic examiner to determine what has happened. Was it involved in an incident? What was the nature of the incident? What all happened? And they've also asked me to provide some recommendations for them on what they can do to um, mitigate factors if there was a breach. So, I'm going to conduct an investigation and I want to do this on the disk, a disk I want a disk image of their primary server and I tell them, I want you to send me a disk image of the primary server and they say, no sweat, we'll send you a USB. Great. So I wait. Now to do this analysis, I'm going to use a VM 
running the SANS SIFT workstation distribution. SIFT, I've forgotten what SIFT stands for, but it is a whole bunch of free open source forensic tools that SANS provides. You can go out to their website, you can download it, um, install it. It's got a whole bunch of forensic tools in it um, to make a forensic examination very easy. Um, now, some of you may be asking, well, why is he using SIFT? Why doesn't he use Kali? Well, you could, but SIFT and Kali are sort of on opposite ends of the universe. Kali you use to break in. SIFT you use to find out how they broke in. Okay, the USB shows up. I get it. And I start looking to see what's there. Well, I look at the USB drive, and it's not what I think it is. It's not a disk image at all. Instead, it's a bunch of VMDKs from their private cloud. Uh-oh. Well, it's not what I thought. This sort of thing actually happens a lot when you're doing forensic stuff. You say to the, cl the client, send me this. They send you something. It's not what you're looking for. So, I didn't get exactly what I was looking for. What am I going to do? Well, number of possibilities. I could always go back to the client. I could go back to PFE and say, hey, look, you didn't send me what I needed. Send me this instead. Well, I don't really want to do that because I don't want to appear to be a whiner. It's not good for the, in an early engagement to be a whiner to your client. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to ask them to send me something else. Another possibility, another possibility, is they sent me a bunch of a, a VMDK, which is a dump of their of their ESX server. I could always plug that into VM Player or something other kind of virtualization piece of software, run that VMDK, use the programs that are on that VMDK to do the analysis of the system itself. Well, I can think of three reasons not to do that, at least three. One, if I fire that VM up, that's going to alter timestamps, that's going to alter file information. I don't want to do that. Really don't want to do that because that's going to just muck things up and that's going to make it more difficult to determine what actually happened. Another thing is, is that the server is believed to be compromised. So therefore, every file, every program has to be considered as suspect. You don't know what may have happened. You run a program, which leads me to number three. The native programs are probably compromised. We believe them to be compromised. This is not a court of law where you're innocent until proven guilty. This is the other way around. This is French court. You're guilty until proven innocent. Big difference. We have to assume that everything is compromised and you run a program on that potentially compromised image and it may have unforeseen, circumstance, un unforeseen consequences that you didn't think about. That program that you're running may be going out to some command and control system out there on the internet and say, hi, I'm alive now. Tell me to do something. Not good. Possibility number three. There's a set of utilities that you can use to access stuff inside a VMDK. But that's another level of indirection and I'm not a very good typist, so that means more typing, which leads to more errors. A better approach is door number four down there. I'm going to convert the VMDK into a raw file, a raw disk image. And then I can plug that into the SIFT workstation and analyze it from there. So, reasonably easy to do. There's a program called QEMU, which is part of the distribution that will allow you to manipulate images 
offline. So what I do is I convert it from a VMDK to raw format. That's what that does. QEMU <coughs> operation is convert from VMDK to raw the image that they sent me where I want it to go. And that goes on and on and on and on. And that actually takes a fair amount of time. And this presentation is sort of like cooking show. If you ever watch cooking shows, everybody watch cooking shows? I love watching cooking shows. The, guy, the, the guys and, 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 and ladies that do the cooking shows are just fantastic. You learn a lot uh, on there. Um, but uh, if you ever watch cooking show, you know that they've got 30 minutes to cook like beef bourguignon or roast duck or something like that. And they go through the process of setting the whole thing up and then they shove it in one, they, they have a double oven, they shove it into the top oven, and then they open the bottom open, which has the completed thing in it. Well, I've done some of that in here so that we don't have a lot of time wasting things going by on the screen. So this is somewhat like a cooking show in that. Yes, sir? I just wanted to ask, uh, are these slides gonna be made available? Oh, yes, okay. yeah, they, they will be made available, yep. If, if not, email me, I'll be happy to send them to you. Um, so, okay, I've now got a raw image, but um, let me talk just a few minutes about Linux file systems. Um, generally, you install Linux and you get either an XT2, XT3, or XT4 file system. Uh, Red Hat has now made their standard XFS uh, with RHEL 7. But in XD2 and XD3, you had three timestamps. Modification, when was the file last written to? Access, when was the file last read? And change. What's this change business? Didn't we already take care of that with modification? No, not quite. Change means something like who owns the file? Was the file renamed? Or did the permissions change? That's what they mean by change. That's usually abbreviated MAC, MAC. Unfortunately, MAC is very overused in computer stuff because you got, okay, I got a Mac up here that's a, that's a, a laptop. There's, it has a MAC address, and MAC also stands for something in security called mandatory access control so Mac gets really badly overused, but those are the three things that all, all the file systems have. Modify, access, and change. XT4, big advance. The file birth time. When was the file created? That got thrown in in XT4. That's really great from a forensic standpoint because now we can know when a file was actually created. Um, Dan Farmer and Vietzi Benema, who also wrote Postfix, wrote this book. It's a good book. Um, a little bit about the timestamps, because we will be talking a lot about time here. When you're talking about a directory, the modification time was when something happened to the directory's entries, like it was renamed or moved or something like that. For other time, for just a regular file, it's when it was last written to last access or when was the last thing that was read for directories when it was searched for a regular file when it was opened up and information was read out of it status change basically we talked about that deletion time i've never really found much of a use for that one but sometimes that that does pop up creation time xd4 records when the file was actually um, created. Where is this information kept? This is what's called metadata. It's data about data. And different file systems do this in different ways. In Linux, it's kept in something called an inode, information node. There's, when you scramble the bits up on a, on a disk and create a file system, you create inodes, 
and those are, they're sprinkled around in various portions of the disc. They have a fixed size. Um, to give a complimentary idea back to the Windows world, uh, there's a thing in Windows called the MFT, the Master File Table, and entries in the MFT are sort of like what an inode is. If you want to look at inodes, you can do ls-i on a file, and that will tell you the inodes associated with the file. And then you can use the istat command to get information about the inode. This will show you the metadata cons uh, attributes of the file. For instance, it will show you the timestamps. It will show you the size in bytes. It will show you who owns it, the group and ownership, and other information. Okay. So, ah, this is to remind me that it's time to do the demo. CSI fans, CSI fans, lots of CSI fans. Why do I have the CSI, why do I say this is the CSI effect? This is really bad for forensic examiners. CSI has really hurt forensic examiners because judges, juries, lawyers, the common man out there believes that you can do an entire analysis in 45 minutes or less. Doesn't work. Can't do that. Really doesn't work like that. Okay. So, uh, almost forgot. I need my crib notes. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, yep, okay, cool. Now let's do this and let's manipulate the mouse over. There's that. And hey, okay. There's my converted image. Okay, so now I need to figure out some properties of this. What have I actually got here? There's a command called mmls that will tell me information about that raw image. because I've got to manipulate the file system. I, know, I need to know some information about that file system. Now, this is like a partition table dump, if you've, if you've seen that through FDIS, but it's similar. Right here, it's one sector long, 512 bytes. That's my master boot record. I don't need to worry about that. Master boot record, that just says, go boot. Then I've got some unallocated space here, because that's just the way it works. But look here, starting at sector 2048, I have a Linux partition. Yay! Good deal. And then some stuff to make it end on a nice boundary. I got a DOS partition. That's, that's my boot partition. I got some soft space. Great. And I know that my Linux, and I know this is a Linux partition because it's, that's the partition number that you do when you 
do a, a, an F disk. This is great. I'm happy. You know why I'm happy? Because they're not using LVM, Logical Volume Manager. Everybody's going, Logical Volume Manager, oh no. Sign of the cross. Stay away. If this did have LVM, yeah, I can still manipulate it. It just takes more manipulation to do it. But great. I've got a, um, I don't have to worry about that. I'm interested in this right here. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the file system stat command and I'm going to point it at an offset of 2048, which is where my Linux petition starts. I'm going to get some information out about this. It's going to help me in my analysis. Okay, great. Right off, I see great information here. It's an XD4 file system. That means I can get creation times out of this stuff. <coughs> the next two lines. When was it last written? When was it last file checked? So I know that. That will help me narrow down any dates that I want to look at on this thing. It was last, it was you mounted properly. That means that they just didn't turn the machine off or pull the power cord when they shut it down. Also, it was last mounted on slash. So I do have the, I do have the root partition. My earlier analysis with MMLS led me to believe that starting at 2048 offset sector was where the, the root partition started. That is the root partition, so that's great. And there's a whole bunch of attributes there that journaling was on. Uh, some other stuff that's not really important, but the important stuff is that it was you mounted cleanly. This is the slash partition, and I've got some idea about dates here. Now, as it turns out, the good folks at PFE have told me that they think the machine was compromised sometime between March the 1st and March 31st. So that gives me kind of an idea of when the bad events may have happened. Now, I take this with a grain of salt because Verizon publishes this thing every year about uh, intrusions. It's called the DBIR. You can Google for it. One of the things that comes out of that is how long it takes an entity to figure out they've been compromised from the time it was the compromise occurred to when they figured it out. Anybody want to take a guess at what the average is? Is that like a month or two? Six, Six months. months. Six months. Two hundred and five days in the latest oh. one. That's seven months. That's how long between the time the intrusion occurred and they figured out, hey guys, something's wrong. 205 days. That's what's called dwell time, the time that, that from the, when the breach occurs to figuring it out. 205 days for the average, that's a long time for bad guys to be in your network messing around. Does this, pardon? Like if the server was compromised, would that server be monitored or unmonitored or managed or whatever? Or does that really relevant? Uh, I think language? she's asking yeah. about if it's got tripwire or OSF. Yeah. Oh, no, no sure none of that's detections. on here. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's what that's for. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I've got, I know some information about when uh, a, a time span to look over. I've got information about what the client says should be the actual time. Okay, now I've got information here and I want to mount that image so that I can do stuff on it. 
Now I could be real slick Linux geek and take that information and figure out how, how to mount all of that up. Or I could get a program to do it for me. Well, part of the distribution is this program called K part X. It'll take that raw image, look at it, figure out where things actually start for me, and create loopback devices for each one of those partitions that I can then mount. So I don't have to go through and do complex arithmetic to figure out offsets and where to mount the thing up and where the super blocks are and all that happy stuff. So uh, a couple of options to use with K part X that are relevant are create a read-only loopback device. Uh -huh. I do not want to write back data onto my forensic image. That will potentially get me in trouble if I'm called in for uh, to do testimony. Um, there are lots of sharp lawyers out there who do understand some of this stuff. And one of the questions they might ask is, how do you know that you didn't write something back? Well, I mounted it read-only. Oh, OK, on to the next question. Um, Barton 1B for, for verbose, and um, what's the R option do? I forgot what R does. Ah, it's going to add the mappings, the partition mappings, to the system. What were those switches? Minus R, minus V, and what? R A. R A V, like um, remote, remote, automatic vehicle. I have, a, I have a question. So I yes, know sir. that you skipped over LVM, um, but the way you're mounting this, like, I, I just wanted to make sure, is there any, like, risk to, like, if I find a volume group on a disk, like, just using the LVM tools to, like, doing this, getting it, getting it mounted, and then, and then using LVM to, to look at the, at the logical volumes? Um, Does it write anywhere? Oh, yes. It does? Okay. Yeah, yeah. LVM is going to update stuff. Okay. So if, if this were an LVM, I would have to do some more work to get things, to get to this point, but I don't have that problem since it's just a, a, just a flat partition. Cool. Yeah, yeah, LVM does, does uh, LVM to, the LVM stuff does update stuff okay. on, on the vibe. Yes, sir? Could you bump up the font size just a bit? Uh, yeah, to... sure, let's see. say black and white with bigger font size maybe? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Somebody else mentioned it. I was going to. And okay, there's that. Uh, let's see. Um, mouse, 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 mouse. Okay, is that better for everybody? Yes. Thank you. I, I like, I guess it shows being um, where, where I came from because for some reason or the other, I like green on black. Um, traditional. It's traditional, yeah. Uh, but yeah, for, for projecting like this, this is better. Um, the, um, everybody here, I'm sure, has seen the matrix. You do realize that stuff inside the matrix, when they're inside the matrix, that was shot through a green filter because the Wachowskis wanted to go back to the old days when it was green phosphors on a black background. Yeah, that's why everything is green when they're inside the matrix. When they're not in the matrix, they shot it through a blue filter to give sharper contrast. Okay. 
All right. Uh, oh, forgot. Sudo. Sudo. Bingo. Okay. Just created a bunch of loopback devices, and this one is my main partition there. Now, all I need to do is get that mounted. Bingo! I've now got my raw partition, the raw disk file, mounted up, and there's all the stuff under there, like we would expect. Does it just create the loop back device in depth? Or like, is it a subdirectory in there? Um, K part X actually creates it in dev mapper. Dev mapper. Yeah, it actually creates it in dev mapper. Um, and it creates a partition, it creates a loopback device for every partition that it can see. Okay. So, so there were there were three on there. There was the root partition, there was the boot partition, there was swap partition, so it creates three of them. And in that order. Okay, so now I've got it mounted. Okay. Um, let's get rid of that. Okay. Um, I got it mounted. Now here's where you can sort of see a difference between uh, two different types of forensic examiners. There's one kind of forensic examiner that they get this mounted and they go, oh boy, I got file systems and files and all this stuff. Let me just start trailing through it and pick up stuff. Well, that's one way. I call those people that do it that way creepers because they just kind of creep through the file system looking here and there for whatever interesting stuff they may be trying to find. They've got their own little kind of idea about how they should be, of where things are and where things are located and what things are important. Um, that's great. But that's one way to do it. The problem with that is, is that if you are ever called in um, to give testimony or to tell about what you've done and you're up there uh, on the witness stand or talking to uh, the corporate lawyers, what would you do? Well, I kind of just rolled through things and I looked at different things out there and I found this and I found this and I found this other thing and you know, th this doesn't look good. This doesn't look good. This doesn't answer the primary questions that your client is looking for. The who, what, when, where, why, and how of something occurred. What you want to do is you want to create a timeline of events that happen. Now, there's any number of ways that you could do this. You could do this by hand, but there's another way to do it. Um, it turns out there is this uh, great set of tools called PLASO, P-L-A-S-O. It was originally invented by some guy in one of the Scandinavian countries, and it's been tremendously improved on. It works, it understands Linux, it understands Windows, and it understands various output formats. You take your raw image, submit it into this thing called log2timeline, and that runs through the file system, looking for different things based on what you tell it what type of system it is. For Linux, it understands things like log files, WTEMP, BTEMP, uh, Apache uh, log files. Um, it understands things having to do with browser log files. And it creates a database based on that information that it finds. Then you can feed that into another program called PSORT. PSORT will transform that database into some other format that you can use and manipulate. For instance, you can have it set up, put out a CSV file, comma save separated variables. Or you can have it spit out a um, Excel, Excel spreadsheet type file and look at that. If you're going to go that route and use a spreadsheet to look at this information, I highly recommend that you spit out the Excel file rather than CSV, it's much faster in looking through it. Um, you can get a MySQL, uh, a, a MySQL database out of it. Another possibility that I particularly like 
is it will write directly to an Elasticsearch instance. Elasticsearch is great. It is one of the best indexing things on the planet, and it's free. It is free. You could, if you wanted to, take all the Star Trek episodes from all, all the scripts from the, the original Star Trek, feed them into Elasticsearch, and then say, Elasticsearch, what episodes did Dr. McCoy say, I'm a doctor, not a blank? And it would tell you. That's how good it is. Um, okay, so this is, this is the part of the cooking show here, because uh, this actually takes a fair length of time to go through and create that database and then spit something out into Elasticsearch. Um, when you look at the slides, you'll get the command. But I've got the database, the, the timeline spit out into an Elasticsearch instance. And there it is. This is Kibana. Kibana is the interface to Elasticsearch. It lets you create dashboards, visualizations, all kinds of neat stuff based on the data that's in Elasticsearch and you can pull it out. Now I have to find something, you, you can get really fancy with Kibana. I've done that at something at work, but for this, just doing this, in, this forensic examination, I got something very simple here. I've got the time, I've got what created the, uh, some information about what created the, the entry, who reported it, and the actual message itself. But also very important is I've got a bar chart up here showing me when stuff happened. And I can see that probably they were right because I've got this big bar right here of activity where things were generating lots of logs. So what I can do, I can go over here and section that off. And it thinks about it. Wow, not a whole lot of activity here. That bears investigation. Let's go over here and section that little bit out. And we think about it. Oh, okay. Hmm. What does this look like? This looks like an install, doesn't it? Or an upgrade. And this goes on. Yeah, this is a lot of stuff. This goes on and on, yeah. Yeah, this looks like somebody was doing an upgrade. So that's, that's really not that terribly interesting. Now, there is the possibility that somebody's being really sneaky about this and they're doing an upgrade, and then while that upgrade is going on, they slip something in under the cover. There is that possibility, but we're, we're not going to go down that path unless we have to. So, yeah, that big spike there wasn't terribly interesting. Um, now, in the Windows world, if you use a program to do a forensic examination like FTK, Forensic Toolkit, or InCase, or Autopsy, you index your image and you want it to go through and find keywords of interest. For instance, if you're doing a fraud examination, you're looking for <coughs> credit card numbers. Credit card numbers for each of the different credit card companies have a particular format. Each one is slightly different, and you can use regular expressions, ah, regular expressions, to find instances of those credit card number types. Email transactions, that actually, name at something dot something dot something. Index for those kinds of things, looking for email stuff. Um, cases of inappropriate use. 
That's always a good one. That's a good, nice blanket term for things, usually involving bad images. So you're looking for JPEGs, GIFs, bitmaps, PNGs. I don't know of anybody that does bad images in PDFs, but I'm sure somebody does, but you can index for those too. So we're not really doing that kind of analysis on this Linux system, but the idea of using keywords in our search is what we want to do now. So we're going to take the customer at his word and assume that it is from the 1st of March through the end of March. And let's cut that out. 23 colon 59 colon 59. Let's go ahead and bring that up. And it's thinking about it. Okay. Okay. All right, there's a big spike there. Um, keywords. What about apt get for doing system management? Let's search for instances of doing apt get. See what may have happened there. Think, think, think. Okay. Uh, okay. There we are. Ah. Looks like there's more stuff having to do with the install there. Okay. Well, that didn't. That's all. In, all stuff having to do with that installation. That's not terribly interesting. Actually, I goofed that. I should have. I should have done that. That's better. Ah. Okay. That's all that that's all that in installation. That didn't really tell us anything. Um, R-E-T-E-R colon. Um, what's another function that system managers frequently do? They add users. Well, that's a good possibility. Ah, pay dirt. Pay dirt. We see that on the 5th, Somebody ran user add, and they tried to add feedbox add. Well, that's not terribly, it's not terribly useful. Um, looks like somebody installed SSH here because they created the username SSHD, and it's set to no login. Oh, but this is interesting. Somebody created a user called John N. And they created a home for it and set the username to Ben Bash, the shell to Ben Bash. That's interesting. You can see some activity now that, that, that looks interesting. Okay. Another possibility. What else do the system managers frequently do? Sudo. Sudo. Well, we'll keep that thought. Keep that thought. Well, they created a user. That probably means that they set a password for that user. I sure hope they did. If they're doing good, um, 
good system management. Did I spell it right? I got the right number of S's. Think, think, think. Okay, cool. Uh, sure enough, they changed the pass. They set a password for this username, John N. Um, this isn't, this is just hearing stuff. That's not important. But look at this. They changed the password for Whoopsie. Whoopsie's a system account. Why would somebody want to change the password for Whoopsie when ordinarily you don't log in through Whoopsie? Elevation of privileges? What's that? Elevation of privileges? Good point. Exactly. They did the same thing here for LightDM. What's LightDM? LightDM is a display manager. Does it ordinarily log in? Nope. Backdoor. Somebody's so, created backdoors in this. If we could look at user mod and see if they changed the shell. Pardon? Uh, could we look at user mod and see if they changed that so they actually could? Uh, we certainly can. U S E R M O D. Um, yeah, they changed SSH. But, but that's a good thought. That's a good thought. A very good thought. Yeah. Um, if they changed the password for the, for the SSH statement, damn. Um, that would show up when we show, when, when we look at password. And that didn't. That didn't show being changed. I mean, it says, says it um, um, Was that activation? That's part of the activation. Okay. That's part of the activation. Um, let's see. Um, did they delete any users? Well, this is kind of weird. They created user John N, and then user John N got removed. But we see that it got added back. So they created user John N, deleted him. I guess they didn't like the way it was set up, and then added him back in. That's kind of interesting. Um, this gentleman over here suggested sudo. System managers run sudo a lot. Very good thing to search for. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, oh, all sorts of good stuff. Okay. Let's see what we've got here. Is this right. a single word search? You Pardon? Can you do a comma? Oh yeah, you can do yeah, you can do a multi-word search. You just got to make sure you're going to close it and close. Um, and in fact, we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. So we see that you, this username John, user John, is doing is acting like the system manager because who doesn't app get why upgrade? So that's going to do all that nice happy upgrade stuff. Wasn't the other user we found not John, but John N? John N. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Well, yeah, we found him. They got created along the way. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he's doing at gets. Uh, this all looks like the legit stuff from when we were in Yeah, this all office. looks like reasonably legit <clears throat> stuff here. Um, yeah, he's doing. He's installing. He's installing SSH here. Okay, what else is he doing? Okay, just basic session stuff. Um, let's see. There he is. There's two different users there. Yeah. Yeah. There's John. John in. That one's cool. Yeah. Oh, no, this is interesting here. Yeah. Oh, uh, look at this. 
we've done a sudo on this particular directory, then bash downloads Jingyi Quan. What's Jingyi Quan? It's a Chinese form of martial arts similar to Kung Fu, similar to Tai Chi. Why is John installing a Chinese martial, potentially a Chinese martial arts program on the company's main server? Does anybody think this is kind of weird? Yeah. Now, what else has he done in here? Oh, he's in this directory and he's done an install. He's installed the program. Well, that's kind of weird. What's this Jing Yi Quan thing? Well, let's go back up here. Let's just search for instances of that string, because this is starting to look interesting. Ah, bingo. Now look at this. Remember I said that Plasso, the whole Plasso suite goes out there to understand Firefox history, browser history? They found this as Firefox history. So we've got, oh gee, they went out to Google looking for a rootkit with this name. Well, this looks pretty bad. This isn't so great. They found Jingyi Quan. And although this is hard to read here, um, they found it on Packet Storm Security. And they actually downloaded it. Okay. What now. if you had done a spin search for rootkit right from the beginning? Uh, we could do that. Potentially, yeah, because that's a string. But the thing to do, you, you, when you're doing this kind of thing, you need to be methodical about it. And I'm just searching for just normal activities that a system manager would do. But yeah, I found rootkit now. Well, that's really inter that's that's very interesting. Okay, we see that this rootkit got downloaded from PacketStorm to the home directory of username John. But who did this? Is this, did John do this? User John do this, the username giant John? Well, we don't have really a clear indication of that. So, we need to track that down a little bit further. It turns out that Firefox and Chrome too, as well, keeps history data in a SQLite database in the user's home directory. So now what we need is we need to be able to look at that information <coughs> to establish whether or not that, really ha that was really useful. Now, anybody's familiar with SQLite, there's an easy way to get this information out. There's a program called, it's a nice GUI program called SQLite Browser. It's free, you download it, you point it at a SQLite database, and it will show you the records in that database. Now, I have done that already in this analysis, but I'm going to use, uh, let's not do that. I'm going to use a web version of it because it looks better on the screen than what you get from normal SQLite. And we're going to open a DB. And we are.
Hmm. Crab. Crud. Um, what I need to do is I need to go to that mount. I need to go where it's mounted, and then go in the home directory of that mount of the, under that mounted place. And if you do an LSBLK, it will show you where. Or you go terminal and type it out. Uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Did I not mount it? Oh, that's right. I did mount it on this particular machine. Oh, because you already had it in the last thing. Yeah, I forgot to mount it on this one. Um, actually. So is Plasso, Plasso another distribution? No, Plasso is a program. Um, actually, here, since you asked that question, and this is coming up in the history, um, this is what you use log to time Call it that the part star at slash that the parsers of Linux. Um, where are you what you want to create the file name that's going to be the PASO database, and then where to start from. That's the PASO command. That, that's the log to time that creates the PASO database. That's the um, uh, log to time that's going to be the the, the input. Um, uh, okay. Now, I mentioned that I that I'm going to send it directly into Elasticsearch. <coughs> this is the command that will do that. P sort output is Elasticsearch for raw fields, and I just give it a, a, an index name that's going to go into Elasticsearch. That's going to be for this particular case, and then my fossil database. And that will read through the database and send it directly into Elasticsearch, the Elasticsearch instance. I don't have to do anything else. OK, uh, let's see. Where's the magic command here? I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have command history. OK. Um, let's see. Where do I Um, let's see. It's also hard to type when you've got your neck bent. Okay. One of these days, we're going to um, all go, go up in a nuclear fireball because somebody at NORAD didn't type the command correctly. You think I'm kidding. Um, I also have um, concerns that um, we're... Um, should it not be in read-only mode for reading the SQLite database? Um, pardon? Should it not be in read-only mode to read the SQLite? I couldn't find any matches for that. Hmm. So uh, no, we do, want it, we do want it to be read-only because uh, it's just going to read, it's going to read the, um, okay. read the file, read, read the raw image. And the, uh, there's the, the there's. Cardex man page says that the tag R flag is for read-only. The pardon? Dash R. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. didn't have it in there. Um, I thought I. Oh, I did. 
Okay, that's bad typing on my part. There should be a dash R there. Okay. Okay, now we're cool. Okay. Let's go back over here. And okay. DB and there and we're going to home. And we've got two users there. There's, there's John in, the one the the the, the unusual one that created, and John and yeah, um, yeah, that that's a very good point. What's what's special about files that start in with a dot in Unix? It's hidden. You sh you do a norm. You just do ls directory name. It doesn't show up. You have to use the dash a to see it show up. Um, no. I need to enable the option that allows me to. Um, no, let's go ahead. Open. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think I already got this. Okay. Um, okay. Ah, there it is. The dot Mozilla directory is where it keeps its stuff. Okay. Uh, keeps it under Firefox. And it randomizes this name here, default. And the. Um, let's see, where is it? Uh, default. Dashes. Ah, here we are. There we are. Places.sqlite. That's the actual name of the database that Mozilla keeps it in. We open that up. And should think about it for a while. Hmm. Okay, let's let me try this again. Ah, there we are, now it worked. Okay, and the particular schema that it keeps it in is over here, and most places. Okay, um, there's some of the usual stuff that you get, but another reason for doing the web version that's the reason for doing the web version is I can click on it and it brings it up all nice and pretty. And that's not terribly interesting. Bookmarks folder. And, ah, here we are. Sure enough. Searching for Jiggy Kwan Rootkit on Google. looks very damning. We now know that user John searched for a rootkit. And it looks like he found something. He found something on PacketStorm. PacketStorm.com. He found Jing Quan Linux rootkit.html, which is a point, which is a web page. Went further, found the tar file, downloaded it, and that's the end of that. Now, let's see, where did our mouse go? Mouse, okay.
Hello, mouse. Okay. Let's do this. See this number? Big long number. That's an epoch time in units. Doesn't mean anything terribly interesting in this, but let's go to a nice website that will convert epoch numbers. Let's go back over, over here. Let's go back over here. Copy. Forgot to point out something when we were back over looking at those records in um, in Firefox. Paste, convert. Should have converted to something else, did I not? It's right right right. Pardon? Oh. Yeah, no, it's, it's right under assuming things. Right below that. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, there's the date there that the download actually occurred. Now we can go back to our Kibana instance and. I think the Kibana stuff's in your time zone, so... Yeah, I'm not sure why the, the time zone got screwed up. It looks like the below it, it says your time zone, and Thursday, March 5th sounds about right. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, it's, I'm sorry, GMT, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not looking far enough, yeah. Um, Any time that you're doing timeline stuff, make sure you get the time zone right. That's, that's thing number one. Ask the client what time zone they're in, that's very important. Rule number two. Never do anything in UTC because it just confuses people <laughs> and you. Okay, so we see that this occurred at 8.13.84 on March the 5th. We go back over here. Uh, that's in military time. Okay, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. So we can say with a high degree of confidence that user John went searching for a rootkit, downloaded the rootkit to his home directory, and did some kind of install. Okay. Um, there's some other things that you can do, do through Kibana here and, and Elasticsearch, but what I want to do is show you know, the question is where did okay Lost my virtual machine there. Uh, I think you just went to the minimize bar. Let's see. Let's go over here. I love two mices. Let's see. Where did my. Oh, there we are. Okay. Ah. Um, one of the things I said is that you can also output to a MySQL database. Um, the MySQL gives you abilities to do some things that you can't really do with Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, they're very good for that initial review when you're looking at stuff. Now. I've loaded 
the timeline into MySQL. This will allow me to do some really fast searches and do some interesting stuff. Now this, of course, is not MySQL. What I've done is I've got it into MySQL and I've said dump, the time, dump all the timeline. And I put this into a file so that I can scroll and search for stuff much more easily. So, uh, not quite. Jing Mi Quan. And he's going to think about it for a while. That's the name of our root kit. And let me think about it and think about it. And while it's thinking about it, let's make this. Ah, there we are. Nine seconds after eight, that correlates well with what we got out of the SQLite browser. And we can see that all of this other stuff associated with, is it going to let me drag and highlight stuff? Yes, it is. Okay. There's the download. Places.sqlite, it got modified. So we can see that it changed. So we can see that that was when the thing got downloaded. Now let me um, search for that again. And are we thinking about it? Yes, okay. Search for it again. Ah, okay. Here we find some interesting activity. Yes, we know he downloaded it, but was anything happened after that? Well, look at this line up here where it says completions.tar. That means they type the tar command and then hit tab to see what kind of completions they could get on the Jingmi Quan directory. And it's creating all of these files underneath there. So we have definitive proof that user John unloaded and unraveled the tar file. Can we see that it was John that did that? Um, I guess I had to have access to John's home directory. Yeah, well, yeah, we, we, will, we will see that shortly. And, uh, yeah, this is, it's gonna go on for a while with that. So that's all on the fifth. He's unloaded it. Ah. Now we're on up on the ninth. And notice this. Oops. Highlight. Running the more program on the readme file. So now we're seeing that he's actually looking at how this program gets installed. At least he actually reads the docs. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the? It's, it's, at least he actually reads the docs. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously this is a, obviously this guy's a great system manager. He reads the readme, he just doesn't uh, go off and do this uh, straight away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do we got interesting here? Oh, okay. Where am I? Um, yeah. Mod, mod dot O. Ah, there's a, there's a, created a file called Zhingyi reverse shell. Now what we can do is we've got the image mounted. We got it mounted. So we can now start looking, seeing if that file, if those files are really there. Oh, now this is also interesting. Some point he loaded in map. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a system manager kind of guy. Yeah, that's kind of a necessary thing to sort of have sometimes. Um, so, okay, now, uh, tell you what, let's do,
search rack. Okay, it's probably. Where is it? Oh. Um. What I'm looking for is. Let's do that. Okay. Pardon? Without the dot slash prefix, it looks like it's got the full file path. Oh, yeah. Mm. This may take too long. Mm. Tell you what. Spell it right now. By the way, thanks to everybody for putting up with my typing. Think, 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 think. Okay. That's where we got the tar. Stuff, make file. Okay, that's on the fifth. You're looking for install, right? Yeah. Uh, go up one page. It was there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, what I want to do, well, okay. Um, yeah, this, okay, this isn't actually going to show that. Okay, we've seen that it's been downloaded, it's been compiled. Um, let me look at my crib notes briefly here. Okay. Um, what about bash histories? Somebody, I think, made that, mention that fact. Um, bash histories are good for stuff. Uh, okay. Um, that's a side point. An important thing is in, in these things is naming items. And this is a, so picking a case number is frequently a very important thing and there's no standard for it. But just pick something that, that you can relate to. This is the system name and the date that this investigation got started. Um, there are... Pardon? You forgot a one in the name. Ah, you sure did. Thank you. Um, there are two hard problems in computer science. Cache coherency, naming things, off by one errors. <laughs> good. Everybody, everybody's still awake. That's good. Great. And actually, um, okay, we're collected. Um, now I can do something like star from um, 
H S T O R E S. Rick, no. You misspelled the order. Sure did. That's the French spelling. <laughs> it's a French sequel. Ah. Okay. Um. This is going to give me every, all of the bash history for everybody that's got a bash history, all the commands. That's, that's not really terribly useful. Now I'm going to do, let me do something. I did this ahead of time. more of the cooking show sort of thing. Okay. Um, so that I can, I don't have to get, you can do the, do the typing faster. Okay. What if I want to see just John's history? And where is it? Uh, oh, that's interesting. In maps the local host. Okay. CDs to downloads does an LS does a CD up CDs to home. Does an LS clear, CD download, LS, CDs to the Jingyi Quan. He reads the README file, he does sudo s, he does an LS, a CD in that local host, quit. Does some more stuff, does some ins modding, does some more enter stuff. And looking at modules, and oh, this isn't what I'm really interested in. Ah, there we are. Goes back to the download, CD Shazing and Quan, does an LS, and does a sudo install. So he's installed the rootkit. So now that's all wonderful. Does sudo dash s. Comes root, looks to see who's logged in, looks at its password. Sudo's to whoopsie, sudo's to lightest to light DM. Interesting stuff. Um, did I, let me see. Yep. Okay. What about that? John N that got created. <coughs> Typed W, catted Etsy password, tried to become whoopsie, tried to become like DN. Great. The plot thickens. Um, actually, let me go back up. Go back to John. There's something I wanted to point out that I found. Uh, where is it in here? Ah, here we are. Okay. Yeah. Like Ben Bash, he adds username John N. Then he deletes it. Okay. Then he adds it back. Then he does something real strange. He CPs Ben True to Ben False. Okay. Think about what's happening here. Ben False is the default shell for most system accounts. So that if someone tries to log in, all it does is it returns a false value. 
and, in, and terminates. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to set up a back door, but he's setting up the back door wrong. Copying bin true to bin false isn't going to create a login that you can log into because what's, what's going to happen? It tries to log into it, it returns a true value and then quits. That's not terribly useful. Then he realize, sort of realizes the error of his ways here. He, create, he creates a password for the system account whoopsie. He creates a password for LightDM. And then he realizes his mistake, and he copies bin bash to bin false. So now, any system account that he's created a password for, whoopsie and light DM, he can log into as back doors. Then he tries to edit group, and he goofs the path name. Easy enough. He edits the group. CDs to Etsy. LS is the group. That's the password, CDs to home, does an LS. And now here's where he does a little bit of trickery. He moves John to dot John in, John in to dot John in, making it a hidden file. So if someone CDs to home and they just do a plain old LS or LS dash LS, they're not going to see it. And he does an LS, I guess, to make sure that this really did what he thought it did. And he does an LS dash L to really make sure that he did. And then, he edits Etsy password to do something. He looks up the man page for said, and then he says home John, and he ch what he's doing is he's changing an Etsy password where John N's home directory is. And he does it through said. Everyone see that? Then he realizes that doesn't quite work. So he says, okay, I'll put it in quotes. Now it'll work. Then he tails Etsy password, and then he does an install again and then maps the host. Neat stuff. We got some really good forensic evidence that user John is doing interesting stuff. He's creating bogus accounts. He's creating backdoors with system accounts. He's downloading rootkits. Uh, now, um, do I have this as a file already set up, or do I want to do? Oh, okay. Let's see. Let me go back over here to my my crib sheet. Um, Oh, um, if I want something that I, let me see how we're doing for time. Not doing good for time. Okay, uh, remember he copied bin bash to bin faults? Since the file system is mounted, we can CD to that. We can LS bin and faults in, bin, in the bin directory that we've mounted. Look at the sizes. Sizes look the same. We can MD5 sum them to see if they are in fact the same file. This is just correlation generating further evidence. Um, what I'm gonna do here is look at some of the login information that's been captured in our database from the timeline. Now we can see the logins of when things occurred. And um, let's see where, ah, John N, okay. Light DM, system was rebooted. they were logged in, but look at this. Remote logins from this other server. John is logged in from that machine there. 
system 192.168.56.1. John logged in, light DN logged in, John logged in again. Interesting. We need to make sure we tell our client about this. There are two reasons why. One is just plain old ethics. The other one is, is that you can say to them, hey, I'm already doing a forensic analysis for you. I'll be happy to do this other machine for you for an add-on, <laughs> extra money, something a manager of mine told me many years ago when I was in the roving consultant game. Never leave money on the table. Okay. Since we are rapidly getting out of time here, let's... Okay, where's my, where's my mouse? Mouse, mouse, where's the mouse? Nope. Okay, this one, and let's go back to this. Okay, timestamps, I know, demo. Conclusions. John searched for and downloaded and installed a root kit named Jingyi Quan. I did some research on what Jingyi Quan does. It's a root kit that hides processes. It hides files, directories, network connections, creates backdoors, bad stuff. Go out to PacketStorm, you can download it and look at it. He created a username, John N, hid the name. He copied Ben True to Ben False and then realized this wasn't going to work. And then he copied Ben Bash over Ben False so that system accounts that normally don't have an act, that don't normally log in, can log in as backdoors. <coughs> He changed the password, created passwords for Whoopsie and LightDM. These normally don't have passwords. Um, user John N logged in. Uh, he tried to become Whoopsie and LightDM, but this didn't work through an SU. That, I don't have that, didn't show you that, ran out of time. The reason why is that he forgot that John N has to be in Etsy sudoers to be able to do that. Conclusion, PFE1 is severely compromised. My recommendations, burn the thing down to the ground, start over. Get out the distribution media, apply all the relevant patches. Create a, syslog, a centralized syslog server that all the systems in your hybrid cloud log to so that you have a centralized point so that you can do correlations and to prevent system managers that are really nefarious and start deleting stuff out of logs. Um, audit logging on root so that you have all the commands that root lo does logged into your syslog file. And finally, investigate this other IP address because it was used as a pivot point. Like I said, that's good ethics because you found this information. And the second one is, first is uh, <clears throat> enlightened self-interest. This may mean more money for you. Okay, I'm out of time. Sorry. Questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, do you have any right? So it seems like the folks that are hiring you to come do this are folks that like need your help. Like, can you talk a little bit about the, how you tell the story of what this person did and like maybe some some tips for? So how do you how do you communicate to a customer that all of the stuff that this guy did is bad news and that he was like being like? Are you generally talking to people who? know what a backdoor, like, what it means to change the shell on a system user, that kind of stuff? Um, that, that depends. Um, if you're doing, since this is in a corporate environment, uh, odds are that you're going to be talking to system manager types. Hopefully, the user who is uh, John is not in this meeting, <laughs> uh, but you never know. Um, and you're going to be talking to lawyers. So you're going to be talking to the corporate lawyers because they may have, and, and HR, because they may wish to bring legal action against John. They may have grounds for dismissal also. That's probably grounds for dismissal. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, this is, this is uh, unless the guy is, you know, the, the, the CEO's brother-in-law. Or he's a security guy. Or, yeah, uh, well, he's obviously not, yeah, not a real good security guy. But, but um, 
Um, when you're when you're dealing with the non-system manager types, you you are going to have to do some level of explanation for the lawyers and the HR people. But um, it turns out that more and more lawyers in in the corporate environment uh, and and uh, uh, prosecutors, public defenders, they're they're learning more and more stuff about this. So it's getting better. But yeah, you're going to have to explain some stuff to them about why this is bad. Um, and that, that's that's just part of it. And um, the best way that I can I, I can give you two tips on how on how to do that. One is ask them what they know about. And if they, for instance, if you talk about a back door and you say, I don't know what a back door is, ask them, okay, uh, do you have a house? Does it have a front door? Yes. Does it have a back door? Yes. Okay, the back door is an alternate way of entry, right? Yep, okay, yeah, okay, you, good. You understand back doors now. The other thing is draw a picture. Drawing a picture works really well if you can somehow draw a picture because that, that makes the little light bulb over the head go on. But that, those are the two techniques that I use, is find out what they know and explain to them the concept in something that they know, and then draw, draw pictures. Pictures really work well. If you do diagrams, the more boxes and lines you have in your diagram, the more funding you can get. The, the more what? The more funding you can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of that, um, as a word of advice, if you are presenting something to corporate types, if you can draw, if you can turn uh, your graph, if you can make, make a pie chart, make a pie chart because corporate types understand pie charts because pie charts mean food. <laughs> <laughs> they understand food. Really well, and it, that's yeah. If you can make it a pie chart, that works really well because that that they understand food so well. Yes, sir. So, how would you actually prove that John was sitting in the seat doing this rather than somebody else? You, you like can't. Off? That's why through this, I have tried to say, you user can. John, right, and not John. It is user John, unless. I am sitting, unless I'm standing over John's shoulder, watching him type, I cannot prove that it was John. Yeah, not even if he was sitting at the desk or anything. Pardon? Not even if he was sitting at the desk. Well, in time. this particular case, since he's coming in, there are instances where they're coming in, they're pivoting off of another server, all, all bets are off there. All what I can that, do. What if that other IP wasn't another server? What if that was like John's desktop, though? Um, I mean, uh, again, it, it starts getting to yeah, be sure. kind of a, a, a very much a gray area, and this is where legal and HR come in, because you would want to get onto that workstation and see when, who was logged in at that time. If John was logged in at that time, well, it's probably a good bet that it was John typing it. But again, you weren't standing there watching it, so you don't know. You can merely infer that John was at his workstation and went to the server and did this. It yeah. is not your job. To and, 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 it, and, and it is not, it is not my job as a forensic examiner to prove that. My job as a forensic examiner is to the five W's and H, the who, what, when, where, and why. And all I can do is say that it was user John. I can't infer, I can Depending on the evidence and other things that are found out, yeah, I could infer that that, that is, but I want to get away from doing, <coughs> from, from actually making the implication. That's up to HR and legal to decide whether or not it was really John. All I can do is present the best evidence that I can as to what occurred, and that's that's why a timeline is so important. Yes? Your uh, scope from the company well, was not but your scope was to determine if the server had been compromised. Yeah, right. And that's also part, uh, again, in part of the agreement, the service level agreement and the service level objectives, what, what are you agreeing to deliver to them? Well, obviously a report, but they wanted, to, they wanted to find out, was the server breached? 
what was the nature of the breach, and some and something about the time. Um, that's and recommendations. That, and, and recommendations, and we have a, a good set of recommendations there, which is just good best practices anyway on, on something like this. But a, a lot of what you a lot of what you deliver is dependent on those on those two things: the service level agreement on what you're going to do and the service level objectives on what you're, you're, you're ultimately going to deliver. And your job is not to prove. No. That yeah. It could be me, Kathy, logging in with the account named John. Yeah, it, it might be somebody that's stolen John's password. Or they just popped open a root channel on John's computer because it wasn't encrypted yeah. and then yeah. he's got SSH. Yeah. Or as what happened to me, somebody jumped from my machine to another and then it yeah. looked like it pivoted off. Me. Yeah. Um, the, there, the, the determination of guilt or innocence or anything like that, that's up to, in this case, since it's a corporate thing, that's up to HR and legal to decide. Um, if this were, um, say, uh, uh, an instance of, of fraud uh, involving credit cards, um, that is something that the jury in, in, the, in the criminal case would have to decide. And you're... Uh, uh, you were talk somebody was asking about presenting uh, how do you how do you talk to these people talking to the jury uh, so that they can understand some of this stuff that becomes really critical in your part as a forensic examiner is being able to explain why is a root kit bad and you might actually have to do a demo of that particular root kit for why it is bad to them uh, that, that is a real possibility. Uh, that's also a real possibility in the, in the corporate world, too. Um, but, um, yeah, it's... Um, one thing, too, you might have looked at um, is what is a corporate acceptable, poli acceptable use policy. Yeah, no... Uh, hopefully you have one. Well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully you do have one. Now, it may be that John, now, now John may be the system manager, and he may be the brother-in-law of the CEO, and he says, well, I was experimenting with uh, this rootkit so I could find out how it works. Well, that's kind of a lame excuse, because that's what VMs are for, not corporate servers. Um, but, yeah. And is he authorized to have that software? No, if, uh, some places just having nmap alone, uh, that, that's bad. Yeah. But but down but searching for a rootkit, downloading the rootkit. Well, you know, searching for a rootkit. Well, that's kind of bad. Downloading the rootkit. Well, that that's not real great. Compiling the rootkit. Well, that's that's really not so good. But then typing point slash install. Not good. That is really not good. That that gets around. That gets around any idea of acceptable use. But as a forensic examiner, you are not charged with proving a person's guilt or innocence. That's always a legal issue, no matter what type of case. Just because you own the gun, it's only illegal if you use it. To do harm. <laughs> I, where I work, I am not allowed to have an map on my desktop. Really? Wow, wow. There were even questions, used to be even questions about having TCP dump on my desktop to use to manage servers. At one point, they were not allowed as system administrators to have that on their desktop. That was restricted to certain groups. Even Wireshark, like a packet analysis tool? That was even worse. Oh, so yeah. They restricted that to certain groups. So, yeah, I came in one day and we had no access, our network to our office was done because my office mate had done a little bit of support scanning to determine, for, for a reasonable and a legitimate purpose, he was trying to determine what was open because he'd been asked a question. And the group that was charged with scanning our networks turned our network off to the office because we were not an authorized group to do that. So, what is the company's acceptable use policy? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for thank you all for coming. Yeah. I met your mercy from last year. Ah. Last year you gave a wonderful presentation on IP tables and IP set. Yes. So yes. I've actually spent the last year playing with.